I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ajox Frederick from BNK Securities India Private Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. So you are in the main conference. Please go ahead with your opening remarks. Uh, thanks, Faisal. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining the call. On behalf of Badiwala and Kerala Securities, we welcome you all to the Nippon Life India Asset Management Limited 2Q FY21 Post Results Conference Call. I would now request AD and CEO Mr. Sandeep Sikka to start the call with his opening remarks on the results, post which we can start the Q&A session. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Q2 FI21 earnings conference call. We have with us Pratik Jain, Chief Financial Officer, Sagata Chatterjee, Co Chief Business Officer Distribution, Ashwin Dugal, Co Chief Business Officer Institutional, Arpan Sa, Chief Digital Officer, Fuji Kakesan, nominee from Nippon Life uh, Insurance Japan. It has been one year since the change in shareholding. Since then, the Nippon India mutual fund brand has been widely accepted by investors and distributors, especially in B30 locations. In this period, despite a lockdown for over six months, we have achieved important milestones towards increasing the investor base and diversifying our asset mix. Nippon India mutual fund added over 281,000 new retail folios. The fixed income assets rose by 21% driven by activation of over 600 institutional clients including 27 out of the top 100 Indian corporates. We completed one of the largest digital NFOs in H1 uh, for Nippon India Multi Asset Fund. The NFO garnered Rs 7 billion with the participation for uh, participation by more than 80,000 investors spread across 370 locations. We manage a comprehensive bouquet of products in the passive category. Nepal India Mutual Fund's Gold ETF is the biggest in its category and has doubled in the last 12 months to cross Rs 51 billion in assets as on September 2020. We consolidated our product mix, product offering further through the launch of India's first uh, information technology ETF and the small cap 250 index fund. The IT ETF has assets over Rs 7 billion in September 2020. NAM India received a prestigious mandate to manage post office life insurance and rural post office insurance funds. This is the first government mandate after shareholding change and greatly enhances our credibility across domestic and foreign investors. As on September 2020, Nippon India Mutual Fund maintained its high market share of unique mutual fund investors in the industry at 29%. Nippon India Mutual Fund improved its share marginally over this quarter, a testament to the retail, strong retail presence. In Q2, despite partial lockdown, we added more than 168,000 retail folios. We continue to have one of the largest retail agents in the industry at Rs 520 billion. The contribution of retail AEM to total AEM is amongst the highest in the industry at 26% compared to 20% for the industry. We continue to be amongst the leaders in beyond 30 cities category. This category contributes AEM of Rs 363 billion. Rupees. Over 18% of the total assets are sourced from these locations against the industry average of 16.1%. As on September 30, 2020, 69% of the individual assets have a vintage of more than 12 months against 68% on 31st March 2020. On a gross basis, Nippon India Mutual Fund added 312,000 SIPs and systematic investment folios in the quarter. The progress highlights a retail execution capability during the challenging period. The analyzed systematic transaction book is at Rs 74 billion. During the quarter, new digital SIP registration grew by 117%. In volatile markets, folio, uh, folios with lower ticket size have demonstrated 
longer vintage and better stickiness as a part of our de-risking strategy we have specific focus on etf aif and other offshore businesses as one of the largest etf players with a market share of 13% in this segment nippon india mutual fund manages an aum of rupees 286 billion excluding epso allocation which goes to two public sector owned mutual funds we are one of the largest etf players in the country nippon india etf has 33% share of the industry etf investors in q2 we added 151000 etf folios as against 97600 for the entire previous year nippon india mutual fund has 70% share esc and msc put together nippon india etf average daily volumes cross across key funds are far higher than the rest of the industry in our aif business we manage category 2 and category 3 aif across various set classes launched in 2019 nippon india digital innovation fund has committed funds of rupees in excess of 100, 100 billion usd and has initiated investment activities as on september 2020 nippon india aif raised commitments of rupees 34 billion across all funds post consolidation in the last few years we expect to grow our existing funds and expand into further categories in aif and pms in future as seen in a recent nfo online and digital assets have become a key source for investor acquisition and communication digital platforms contribute 48% of our uh, total due purchase transactions we continue to benefit benefit from our early investments in digital ecosystem and executed 4.8 lakh purchases in q2 through the digital assets an increase of 31% we have ongoing tie ups with over 20 digital partners nippon india mutual fund has well diversified and nimble uh, distribution base we added over 400 ifas in this quarter to take the ifa base to over 77000 as on september 2020 we have approximately 77400 distributors and panel with us direct channel contributed 53% of the mutual fund aum of the distributed assets share of ifas was 54% 79% of the distributed assets are contributed by individual investors Nip- nippon india mutual fund has a wide presence uh, through approximately 290 branches across the country we continue to review our existing branch operations and future bra- expansion plans given the new normal our marketing efforts are increasingly focused towards digital channels which are more cost effective as against offline advertising now on our mutual fund assets under management as on september 30th 2020 the aum was 1929 billion an increase of 18% over march 2020 the quarterly average assets under management was rupees 2000 billion as compared to 1800 billion for the quarter ended june 30th 2020 for the quarter ended september 30th uh, september 30 2020 the total income was stable at rupees 3.2 billion profit after tax increased by 6% to rupees 1.5 billion in this quarter overall operating expenses decreased by 20% to 1.3 billion consistent focus on cost optimization and rationalization over this over last 6 to 8 quarters has resulted uh, has resulted in reduction in employee cost and other expenses Op- operating expenses as a ratio of average assets under management reduced from 43 basis point in q2 fy19 to 26 basis point in q2 fy21 with a view uh, with a view to the industry dynamics and prevailing macro conditions we continue continue to evaluate investments for inorganic opportunities and strategic partnerships against this backdrop we will consider deployment of our ipo proceeds towards act uh, towards value creative and strategic initiatives 
To sum up, we are in the midst of an exciting phase with a partial recovery in equity markets, initial signs of economic rebound, and gradual opening of business activity. At Nippon Asset Management India, investor centricity remains a top priority. Complete product suite, superior fund performance, and efficient client servicing through extensive use of technology. Despite external hurdles, on the ground execution remains strong, driven by retail strength, top quality digital ecosystem, and control on cost. We are confident to continue our trend of profitable growth in coming quarters. Before concluding, I would like to also welcome our new board members, Mr. Ashwin Parekh, a financial services veteran with a rich experience of 30 years, has joined NAM India board and has also been appointed the chairman of the audit committee. With reference to Nippon Life India Trustee Limited, leading chartered accountant and industry expert, Mr. Nilesh Vikramse, and Mr. Koi Sano, part of Global Business Risk and Control at Nippon Life Tokyo have also joined the trustee board. We are sure that the induction of such esteemed individuals will further strengthen our board and we will benefit from their valuable guidance, specifically in the sphere of finance, corporate uh, governance and risk management. With this, these comments, we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 at this time. The first question is from the line of Viraj from SIMPL. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, and congratulations for a good set of numbers in such a challenging environment. I have a couple of questions. First is, uh, just want to understand, you know, the yield uh, part a uh, bit better. You know, if we look at sequentially, we, you know, we have a uh, better product mix in the higher share of equity and the retail and the B30 book also is much more higher. Uh, but overall revenue yield, you know, is not really moved up much for us. So just trying to understand, so has there been any change in the channel commission or, you know, uh, so if you can just provide some color on that. And added to that, you know, We've made a lot of changes in the equity investment deal part of the, you know, uh, in the last couple of quarters. Uh, but if we, a, if we look at our overall performance of key flagship funds, especially on the large cap and uh, tax rate or another, uh, fund performance is still, you know, probably at the lower end. Uh, so, you know, where are we in that journey in, in the of, you know, uh, that transition, you know, which will result in a better performance? So, if you just, you know, elaborate a bit more on that. Sure. I'll request Pratik to take the first question on yield, then I'll talk about the fund performance. Uh, so, well, uh, the, uh, you know, in terms of our realization, if you look at, uh, you know, our equity realization remains the same, uh, you know, as what it was last year. However, due to the internal asset mix change in the fixed income category from long duration and credit fund, you know, post uh, the COVID environment and, of course, post the Templeton issue, uh, both industry and we have seen, uh, you know, uh, money moving from long duration fund and, uh, you know, from the credit risk fund uh, because of the extreme conservative behavior to ultra short term and liquid category. And therefore, the yields on the debt fund category has come down, which has uh, resulted in overall decline in the yield. However, uh, on our equity and ETF portfolios, you know, the yield remains to be the same as what it was last year. Okay. okay. I think with respect to uh, the uh, performance of some of our flagship schemes, we've done a couple of changes. I think uh, uh, both few in processes and also we've been add also restructuring of the funds within the fund managers and also have seen addition of new portfolio manager joining us. Uh, Yes, it has taken a little time. I think performance of some of our flagship funds has uh, one or two funds have not been uh, as good. 
but we are very confident some of the new changes that we are doing in processes uh, will definitely in the, over the next few quarters you will see the change in performance. Okay, uh, so can you elaborate apart from new fund management hires, what are the changes you know within the existing team? So is there a need to actually you know uh, are we seeing a need to actually increase the commission payout to you know push the AUM in those funds? Well, I think I've always I think we have always been very clear. I think for us it uh, our focus remains on profitable growth. We do not believe in acquiring business by paying higher brokerages. Uh, that is not a sustainable strategy. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, as I mentioned, I think we have seen both addition of fund managers, realignment of portfolios, and a lot of changes which have been implemented uh, with the feedback of Nippon Life in Japan, on the risk management side from Japan. We are very confident you'll see the uh, positive results over the next uh, few quarters. You will. You may also see addition of new fund managers uh, in the team. Okay. This last question was on the cost side. You know, in the press release, uh, in the footnotes, we talked about this impact of social security code. So, uh, what will the impact, possible impact, could be on our financials? So, so right now the code has not been notified, and therefore, you know, uh, there is no impact assessment, and that's what we have said that currently we are unable to assess the impact and that's what we have put the note in. Uh, however, as soon as, uh, while, you know, we are, uh, we do not deal in, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, lower end segment of the employee where, you know, salary levels are lower. And uh, most of our, uh, all the employees of our are covered both under gratuities and pension schemes. And hence, uh, we do not see material impact, uh, you know, going forward. Okay, I'll come back in detail. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Thanvi from Banyan Tree Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, Sandeep Pratik. Hope all you are doing well and thanks for the opportunity and congrats for a good set of results. Uh, my, I had uh, two questions broadly. One was on the cost structure. So if you look at, uh, you know, the employee cost this quarter has been the biggest, uh, you know, uh, improvement, right? wanted your sense on how you know sustainable this is is this a function of uh, no, uh, lower or no bonus payment this year and it will you know go back to a normalized aid next year uh, that is question number one the second is on you know what's your sense on you know the flows in the industry with you know last time when we were in discussion we talked about you know market hitting the previous size and then the behavior of an investor generally changes from uh, changes uh, that is what we have learned in the history so now with, you know, uh, you know, what, what kind of flow, uh, you know, scenarios that we are looking at and, uh, you know, are, are there any green shoots in terms of reversal of outflows or we are still, you know, two, three quarters behind that uh, green shoots? So I think uh, let me take the first question on the um, employee first, I think. As uh, uh, we have mentioned in past, I think for us the employee cost is uh, constitutes of one third of it is variable. Uh, which is, you know, I think, uh, and we have not, uh, so I think that will always be variable depending on the performance of the company. Um, and over, uh, also, I think what we've been, we've been seeing is, uh, earlier the company did not have ESOPs. Now, uh, going forward, I think as majority, or 15% of the company is covered through ESOPs, I think uh, relatively, I think uh, the PLI part will be covered through ESOPs. So that is number one. Uh, number two, as far as the flows are concerned, uh, from our perspective, the way we, I think, over the last uh, three, four quarters have not been the best for the industry. I think, however, we remain confident, I think, uh, because uh, la uh, over the last few quarters, while the, ma while the ma market is almost at an all-time high, we're almost touching, you know, where it was uh, before the fall mirroring plus minus 5%, you know. But uh, from our perspective, the way we see is, you know, across the industry, um, uh, overall, I think the invest, there has been a slowdown in the flows or equity flows, and uh, we are a part of it. We are a part of it. I think what we are trying to do is, I think we are trying to build our uh, distribution capability, digital capability, and keeping the cost uh, the cost level low, so that as and when these flows come back to the market, I think it only adds to the bottom line. I think so. Uh, however, overall, from our perspective. Uh, one thing is very clear, if I was to look at the last 12 months, 
clearly, I think, uh, and I was to break the last two years broken down into previous 12 months and 12 months before that. Uh, the financial year, you know, I think between October and uh, 18 to 19, we were in a continuously negative outflow mode. I think that outflow has been contained, has been contained. So I think as we are seeing the new investors have not been coming to the industry, but what you saw during our two I, uh, NFOs, whether it's the multi-asset class where you saw almost you know, 800 crores coming in and 70, 80,000 investors, whether the IT ETF, uh, again the same thing. So we remain very confident that I think we, I think once the investors come back, I think we'll be able to gain disproportionately. Till that time we are trying to keep our cost structure low. Because the positive part is, I think once the flows come uh, and the revenue goes up, the cost structure will not go up uh, proportionately. Sure, sure, that's helpful. Thank you, Sandeep. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Nandwani from Centrum. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Question. So one question on the post office AUM that mandate that you have received. So what kind of a top line and a bottom line you are looking at in terms of percentage of AUM? I think uh, bottom line we will not be able to share because being a confidential, you know, I think uh, I think it will be unfair. Uh, but I think from a top line point of view, it adds about uh, 50, uh, 50 to 60,000 crores. 50 to 60,000 crores in terms of AUM? AUM, and out of which about 6,000 crores is equity. Okay. Out of the 50 to 60,000 crores, 10% is equity. Yeah, 10% is equity. And that should be in debt. Oh, yeah, fixed income, yeah. Fixed. And also, uh, on the international mandates, you said that you have received 34 billion commitments. So, what sort of a drawdown are you looking at? Uh, so, those are commitments, right? So, when will they flow to the um, AUM? The uh, ones we talked about the in the, the Indo-Japanese tech fund, the in the AIF, uh, the drawdown has already started. Effectively, we see that in the next two to three years, three years, I think we'll be able to have a complete drawdown of this hundred billion dollars. So for the technology fund, yes, hundred technology fund, yeah. And overall, thirty-four billion commitments that you mentioned in your PPT. That actually is even even shorter, you know, before that. Okay, so within two years. Yeah, tech fund is over a longer period of time, it's about four years, and the no balance is in the next two years. In the next two years. And so what's the sort of yields do you look at, or is it confidential? Uh, the tech fund comes with a basically, I think it's a, comes with a carry. Hmm? Uh, it's a 1% fees, fixed fees, and uh, plus I mean, there is a carry above a certain benchmark. Okay, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, sure, but I'm not sure. So it's like a PE fund. Yeah, yeah it's a PE fund, it's a... Sure, sure. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Madhukar Ladda from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first question on the yields uh, side Is there a reduction in yields on the debt uh, AUM on a quarter or quarter basis? Yeah, so Madhukar, I mentioned that what has happened, if you see, and this has been an industry-wide phenomenon that, uh, you know, if you see in last uh, six or months due to the conservative behavior of the part of the investors, uh, either the money has moved from risk, uh, uh, you know, credit risk funds and long duration fund to the shorter duration, and also the new, all the new money has come towards the ultra short term category. And, you know, there our propensity to earn is uh, lower as compared to historically what we used to charge on credit fund and duration fund. And hence, because of this internal change in mix, mix uh, the debt fund realization has uh, been lower as compared to what it used to be earlier in the last half year. Yeah, but I just wanted to verify whether this has been the case even on a quarter or quarter basis or, uh, yeah. No, so on a quarter on quarter basis, uh, you know, there has been, you know, uh, I don't think so there is a many material difference on a quarter on quarter basis. Uh, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, there we have, uh, you know, on the duration side, again, you know, we have uh, received more money on the shorter term. And therefore, uh, because uh, assets have grown on the shorter duration, there is a marginally decline there as well. If I will see. Okay. Okay. Q121 is 22 basis Yeah, one basis point. So just, uh, Madhukar, Q, Q121, uh, I think the realization in debt was 22 basis point, and which has come to 
or 20.5 now. So there's not much. It's more to do with you know change. You know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Understood. Got it. Uh, and uh, uh, and on the your other income has shot up uh, in this quarter uh, considerably. Can you uh, you know tell us the reasons? No. So the yield is almost the like nine and a half percent. Yeah. Sorry. No. So compared to the last quarter, if you see, it is uh, slightly uh, lower, and this is a function of the uh, you know the market. Because if you recollect, Madhukar, uh, the last quarter of uh, previous financial year, you know we took a hit, hit because of our investment in our own equity and ETF schemes, which has been uh, majoritarily been reversed in quarter one and quarter two because of the market bouncing back. Okay. Okay. So, largely that nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary up there. No, not at all. Okay. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Participants to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Harshwardhan Agarwal from Infina Finance. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. So, want to understand. Uh, uh, on a slide 34, uh, we are sharing the SIT book. Uh, now, uh, even in the last quarter, and uh, when I compare it, the audio is breaking, sir, from your line. Uh, yeah. So, so, can you hear me now? Uh, hello. Yes, sir. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Thanks. Uh, so, 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 just wanted to understand on our SIT book, uh, uh, which is which I mentioned on the slide 34. So, for the last three quarters. I'm seeing even the past numbers are getting restated. Uh, so, any specific reason for that? Yeah. So, uh, see, what we have done is, you know, uh, you know, in order to give the appropriate disclosures, you know, we have made the changes with the, uh, you know, if you look at the footnote, you know, these are the actual cash received. You know, earlier, uh, what we used to report to MP was the, uh, the actual commitment. Uh, you know, and uh, in the last quarter, what we put across was the, uh, uh, you know, how much the active uh, folios which used to be there. What we have done in terms of uh, improving our disclosures, this time what we have put across is the actual cash received each quarter. And, you know, we'll continue to this disclosure uh, going forward as well. Okay, great. Uh, so, sir, uh, one, one last thing is if you can share the, the SIT count for the quarter. So, which, which was like 3.4 million last quarter, and if you can share that number for this quarter. This, this is the, it is uh, more or less flat. However, you know, this uh, two set of data, uh, you know, which we have, uh, you know, we're working on. So overall, uh, SIP registered with us is 3.2 billion. 3.2 million. 3.2 million. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shreya Shivani from CLSA India Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Sai Kiran CLSA. Uh, just two questions. If you look at it broadly on the revenue yield, which if I look at in the last six quarters, uh, have uh, seen a uh, sharp uh, downward uh, trend. Uh, how do you look this? Of course, some portion, as you had highlighted recently uh, in the one of these questions, is the deals being softer and you now some of the mix a in the AM also has changed. But where do you see this getting settled over a period of time? That's question number one. And question number two is that uh, uh, in terms of the cost, you had explained that one third of the staff cost is typically variable and then uh, probably some sort of a PLI will shift into the ESOP over a period of time. Uh, does that mean that uh, the cost rationalization primarily is more or less done? Probably we are at the bottom of the cost, uh, both on the staff as well as the admin cost, which also has seen sharp uh, a downward movement. And the question of the key is that in terms of other income, uh, uh, you had mentioned that some sort of an MTM gains on ETFs and as well as the MC investment. If you can give us broad breakup in terms of the investments, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you know, in terms of the realization decline, uh, last year in April, uh, you know, uh, we have seen the regulatory changes, and due to which, uh, you know, uh, there has been a revised uh, guidelines by SEBI 
in terms of uh, chargeability on the AM on the equity side, which lead to certain decline. And now it is on a you know cumulative AM. You know you can you have to charge fees on a uh, declining basis. Uh, so that was the one trigger. Uh, if you are talking about the long term, you know how this has changed. However, also earlier uh, from a distribution side, there used to be uh, an upfront brokerage which used to be paid out, which used to be paid out from the AMC, and hence there was a higher realization because the trail fees corresponding would be lower. Uh, now what has happened? The upfront has been banned, and since then, you know, uh, all the AMCs are now paying on a trailer basis, and hence the overall realization has uh, declined. But uh, if you see for the last uh, two, three quarters, you know, it has become more or less stable now. And now it has become more of a function of the asset mix, both equity and debt. And in debt also among, you know, various categories, like, you know, of course, you know, your propensity to charge where the investor earnings are higher is remains higher. So credit fund and duration fund is likely to yield higher realization as compared to the ultra short term and money market uh, schemes coming to your next question on the employee cost uh, as far as the employee cost is concerned i think uh, at this point of time uh, we feel i think we're adequately staffed uh, firstly i think and uh, a lot of measures which we have to take on rationalization have been taken i will not say that i think this is the rock bottom you know i think uh, but i think the way you need to see this is uh, clearly um, we are, we are adequately staffed, I think from a bandwidth point of view, as business grows, as business grows, uh, I think this cost will not go up. So uh, I would like to put it the other way around, employee cost as a part of, as a percentage of total expenses, that might be rock bottom, uh, but uh, otherwise I think clearly from our perspective as we uh, grow business, as incremental flows come, the employee cost otherwise uh, as a percentage uh, will only go down. Got it. And uh, anything you would like to comment on admin costs as well? Sorry? Yeah, on the admin cost, uh, you know, we continue to work. You know, if you see the last eight to ten quarters, we have been working, uh, you know, towards uh, making our systems more efficient. And we'll continue to make this effort. However, in terms of the, you know, as, as we keep growing, the marginal decrease will be uh, comparatively lower, but we'll keep our efforts on to further make our systems more efficient. Coming to your last query on MTM impact, uh, you know, as I mentioned that, you know, the total other income uh, for the uh, first half year has been almost about 160 crore. And, uh, you know, of that, uh, close to about uh, 80 or uh, 50% of it is because of the MTM on our investment in equity schemes. Uh, and rest is all, uh, you know, returns what we have generated on our debt scheme as well as, uh, you know, other interest and et cetera on our other investments of uh, FDs and preferentials, et cetera, bonds, et cetera. Great. Thanks, Lord. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manoj Baheti from Carnelian Asset Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. Hi, Tuti. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Manoj. Hi, Manoj. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, one question I had. Like, if I see uh, your overall yields, uh, it has come down, which you have explained, maybe because of change in product mix. But just taking forward the previous participant question, like a uh, uh, drop in employer benefit expenses from 85 crores to almost 68 crores YOY basis, as well as other expenses from 56 crores to uh, 44 crores. So uh, just wanted to understand like what contributed to this kind of decline? Is there a headcount reduction? And uh, the objective uh, is that how do we See these expenses uh, moving, going forward with uh, increase in AUM and as we uh, return to normal situation. Uh, so Manoj, uh, you know, uh, almost about two quarters back also I mentioned and again repeat that look from our uh, employee benefit expenses, you know, uh, we had three portions. One is the fixed cost. Uh, second is the, uh, you know, as Sandeep mentioned, variable cost, which is the PLI part of it. 
then third is the ESOP head, you know, because obviously, you know, uh, we use the Black Scholes uh, model to, you know, account for the ESOP cost. So that follows, uh, you know, it tapers down. So it will be higher in the initial years and it will keep coming down. So going forward, it will keep coming down. Mm -hmm. As far as the, uh, you know, uh, the employee cost is concerned, uh, you know, we see, uh, you know, uh, another 5 to 10% decline due to the ESOP cost. And the PLI remains the function of our business. Uh, you know, if the business uh, does well, obviously we'll put across a percentage of profit towards our uh, PLI. If business does not do well, so that gives us flexibility. Also, uh, you know, uh, what as a company, as a policy, you know, uh, uh, you know, we are making more and more, uh, uh, you know, going forward, uh, as Sandeep mentioned, uh, more and more people who become part of the ESOP will uh, continue to earn, uh, you know, the uh, uh, money from the ESOP valuation and the dependency on the variable PLI will continue to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, for better alignment of uh, the individual as well as versus the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, as regards to the administration cost, uh, you know, we have been working uh, very, very hard uh, given the feedback from the analysts and investors uh, you know, and we've been bringing it down. However, the propensity going forward to, you know, further decline, uh, you know, uh, or, um, you know, larger decline remains uh, muted, but we'll continue to put in efforts to further improve our uh, operating uh, margins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, secondly, on yield part also, if you can uh, cover like whether this quarter is an aggression in terms of change in product mix, you expect you to move back uh, on a forward trajectory of uh, this kind of product mix uh, you are expecting to the new normal? No, so let's say, Manoj, if you, what happens, let's say, uh, if everything remains normal and just the market moves 20% up because of which, uh, you know, equity proportion goes up, you know, what you will see the realization suddenly becoming better because the proportion of equity will become more in the in this one however let's say if equity in market remain muted and more and more money comes in the liquid and overnight fund then probably the realization you know uh, would look slightly comparatively lower uh, so this is becoming a more of a function of what kind of asset growth is happening in the industry uh, but in terms of realization as sandeep mentioned that you know we remain committed to profitable growth and you know we are not going to be paying excessive distribution fees to garner the assets. And also, I think even in fixed income, uh, what we, uh, what we have seen in this quarter, the last two quarters, real risk aversion, people coming, I mean, moving towards short term liquid funds. I mean, that also cannot remain like that. I mean, we have seen human nature, investor sentiment also keeps changing, and uh, and it changes very fast. So. To, uh, to the question that what Pratik mentioned in equity, you could see, you know, I mean, uh, again, uh, the mark to market with the valuations, the yield could get better. But in fixed income also, I think I expect this uh, change happening faster. I think people will, you know, from complete risk aversion, you know, where when everybody's moved towards more uh, fixed income, uh, sorry, liquid, ultra short term floating, you will see them move back to again long, uh, long term products. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for taking my question. I have one more question. Uh, that is uh, your treasury allocation. Like if I see overall 2,600 uh, kind of treasury costs, only 281 crore is in equity. So uh, are we seeing, because this money is uh, there with us for long term, and in today's ultra low interest rate, is it uh, and uh, you are managing other uh, equity? So just wanted to understand uh, that uh, are you uh, looking for some kind of change in this allocation or it will remain uh, like this? No. So uh, Manoj, uh, again uh, to reiterate, last quarter also we mentioned that uh, you know we are see first of all these investments uh, were made only in our equity scheme. Uh, to show uh, the skin in the game. This was more of a comfort capital into our own schemes, uh, both equity and ETF. However, looking at the volatility, uh, what we have seen in the uh, last quarter, uh, based on uh, you know that kind of volatility which we do not want, we have started paring down our uh, exposures in both in equity and ETF. 
and in the last uh, six months, we have almost uh, reduced our equity and ETF exposure by 80 crores. Okay, 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 okay. thanks, thanks for this. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Viraj from SIMPL. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. I just had a question, a uh, couple of questions. First is on the ETF presence. Uh, you know, in the past, we used to have a much higher volume share and the market share. And if you look at, you know, bulk of the industry is largely catered by two schemes, index schemes from the competing clear. So in the past, we talked about, you know, us looking to scale up this business and have a higher share, you know. So how are you going about with that? So I think from our perspective, we remain, I think, one of the largest. Uh, if you exclude the ETF money, which is invested by EPFO and given to two public sector mutual funds, we remain by far the largest player, having uh, almost 40% market share X of EPFO money. Hmm? We have 70% market share on the volumes of the stock exchange and 33% of the investors of ETF. Presently, we have 19 products spread across um, mutual um, equity, the, both domestic and foreign, uh, sectoral, uh, and also fixed income. The, we during this quarter, we I think our uh, uh, like we have, we have mentioned earlier, our focus will remain that I think we are here to go, uh, provide investor what he feels is right. I think we are one of the few asset management companies which will continue focusing both on active and have a very strong this thing uh, presence in both ETF and passive. So uh, we launched this IT ETF, which uh, which was again in the last 15 days of the quarter, uh, wherein was about 700 crores, I uh, think by the end of the quarter. Uh, and you'll see us continue launching, I mean, uh, uh, new ETFs in this quarter also. Okay. Uh, ETF remains as a very important part of our strategy. We run it as a separate vertical, separate vertical, and we clearly believe, I think there is a big ma uh, market, uh, and I think for based on the liquidity that we, and the tracking error and the track record that we have, we f we are in a very dominant position in this, as far as the ETFs are concerned. Okay. Um, second question is uh, on the use of surplus cash. So you in the early part of the call, you mentioned about us looking at acquisitions. Uh, so what particular product areas we will be looking at, uh, you know, and what is the criteria internally we will be evaluating in terms of you know, uh, pursuing the acquisitions. Yeah, uh, uh, from our perspective, I think uh, in 2017 when we came with an IPO, uh, we had raised 580 crores, uh, uh, out of which certain amount has it was uh, it was for various heads, which included branch network, advertising, digital, and acquisitions. Uh, we have already invested a certain amount in couple of these heads. Uh, last 12 to 18 months, I think post the shareholding change and also post the, uh, in the six months of a lockdown, we are re-looking at our strategy uh, how to deploy this money. We, our approach will be very simple. Whatever we do has to be accredited, value accredited for the minority shareholders. Uh, we continue exploring acquisition or strategic partnerships uh, uh, over the next one to two years. Uh, but again, our approach will be very simple. As I mentioned earlier, it will not to do with AUM, but it will only it has to be shareholder accredited as well as a, as a add to the uh, bottom line or has to complement our existing businesses, which is very similar to the ETF acquisition, which we had done of Goldman Sachs way back in 2016. And that helped us to create a very strong foundation. So our approach will be, it will be, have nothing to do with uh, uh, AUM, but will be only to do with either it gives us a competitive edge or a strategic advantage. So to put it differently, you know, in, given our existing portfolio and segments, we are, you know, where do we see gaps or where do we see opportunities where we can pursue these kind of, you know, routes? I think I may not be able to get into the exact details of this, but broadly it will be either to do with uh, uh, getting something which complements what we have. Uh, in the sphere of in the area of asset management, not it does not necessarily mean mutual fund. Uh, so I think again I'm saying it, it covers asset management, it covers strategic partnerships, 
or anything that can help us in business. So I think we remain, I think since there is nothing specific as of now to share, I will not be able to dwell too deep into it, but I think we'll keep you updated as we go ahead. Uh, that's all from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the question queue. The next question is from the line of Prayesh Jain from Yes Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity and congratulations on a great set of numbers. Uh, so, firstly, I wanted to understand the strategy with regards to the b market. And where I understand is the IFA is play a much important role as compared to uh, any other uh, any other uh, you know uh, any other channel. So, how do you think you you would be able to, to maintain the confidence of uh, the new, uh, of IFA under the new promoters? And how what's the strategy doing there? I think from our perspective, uh, this has been one of our strong areas over the years. Um, both IFAs and smaller cities and towns. Uh, that is the reason in my address also I mentioned uh, our market share uh, uh, as a percentage of total AUM in B30, uh, industry average is 16% and we are 18%. Uh, we clearly, uh, these are the markets, uh, they have a high entry barrier. And uh, we will continue, I think, with the strong execution capability that we have shown in past. And along with that, the new digital capability that we built up, both put together, this will remain a focus area for us. Okay. And also, also add, if I was to look at uh, the, uh, the NFO that we launched, the multi-asset, which happened just during the complete lockdown, uh, the fact that we got investors from 380 locations in India tells you about our B30 strength. Okay, great, great. And so overall, how do you what, what, how would you strategize to improve your market share? You know, over the years we've seen uh, a consistent fall in the equity market share, uh, particularly on the equity side. Uh, so apart from you know the entry into B30 towns, so how do you see this? Uh, how, what are the other strategies you would be implementing to improve your market share? From our perspective, uh, the key lies in execution. Uh, let me again go back to last 12 months post the shareholding change. Uh, we have seen uh, very good qualitative uh, data points, uh, whether it's to do with 600 new institutional investors, uh, uh, hundreds of family offices coming back. Um, the fact that we have added about three, uh, nearly 3 lakh investors in the quarter compared to uh, last, the last full financial year, we lost 2 lakh investors. Um, the, again, the inflow in fixed income has been faster. In uh, ETFs, again, we've been gaining, I think, uh, both uh, AU as well as new investors. In equity, selectively, I think in certain schemes, uh, we have been getting good flows. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there have been two, uh, two or three of our flagship schemes which have not done so well. Uh, but we are confident, I think, with the steps that we are taking there, which I mentioned earlier, I think you may, we will see flows coming back into those category also. But one thing remains constant for us, um, the fact that our focus remains on retail and smaller ticket size, um, that adds to the more stickiness of the assets. So I think we'll continue focusing. It may not get reflected in the market share directly, but it will. it is uh, going to get reflected in the stickiness of the assets. Uh, I think also, definitely the, yeah. also to add to it, sorry, Mr. Sorry, and also during this period, we saw uh, our gold fund, uh, the gold ETF and the gold fund uh, doubling in size, and also there has become there was the largest and continues to grow. So again, you know, I think other than certain pockets of equity, I think we have seen good qualitative uh, qualitative growth across all asset classes, all investment styles, and different investment categories. Okay. I think performance will be a key to improve the market share. That would be a uh, key drawdown from here. Uh, performance will be one of the important parameters. Will not be the only. Or with only performance okay. without execution, also it cannot run. It's a package. Uh, will be one of the important ones. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishchin Chavate from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Mr. 
Shavati, your line is in talk. Yeah, hi. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, sir. Yeah, okay, sure, thanks. Uh, just two things. One was, uh, you know, if you could uh, give some perspectives in terms of uh, you know, when the, uh, you know, when the uh, mix in the dead side sort of starts becoming a little bit more favorable, you know, as, as in when do you really see the credit funds picking up again? And uh, the second question was, uh, you know, really to understand, uh, you know, uh, get a little bit of color on the distribution side. I believe, uh, you know, some of your competitors are launching new funds uh, and in which I think, uh, you know, they are having incentive programs, et cetera, for distributors. So how do you really see that? How do you compete with them? Or do you, do you see that, uh, you know, more incentive programs are going to be the order of the day? Thank you. So I think I'll start with the second question first, you know. I think we are, as mentioned earlier, we do not believe uh, growth in market share should happen by paying extra incentives. I think it has to be a package of product, uniqueness of product, uh, performance, uh, and execution capability. Any product or relationship which is built up only on brokerage cannot be a long-term solution. So I think so we will never be getting into this uh, race of paying higher brokerage to get a union. So I think that is number one. Uh, as far as the second, uh, the earlier question, I think the pulse that I think if um, we've been talking to our smaller branches and all, clearly from a very, very high risk averse environment in uh, April and May, I think we are clearly seeing things are getting a little better. Very difficult to put a number to it by when I think you will see investors in especially fixed income or in equity becoming, coming back to the uh, normal. But things seem to be far better. I think we have always seen investor sentiment uh, plays a big role. Uh, so I think um, the second question, I may not be able to give a defined uh, date or this thing, but our, our on-ground pulse tells us things are much better compared to two months back. So maybe that is just a bad episode behind us is what one can say. I, I'm just, I, I hope so. I mean, I don't want to give a feeling that I think uh, I can read that, but I like you, I also hope so. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanjay Shah from Alpha Line Wealth Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for opportunity. Uh, sir, um, uh, you cited a very uh, obvious view about the ETFs. So Mr. Shah, the highlight of operator, course, sorry to interrupt you. Sir, the audio is yeah. not clear from your line. Please check. Okay, one second. Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes, please go ahead with your question. Is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah. So, so my, uh, my question was regarding that you cited very optimistic view about the growth on ETF side. So that ETF products are what uh, are we marketing and right now launching. Are the product preference of the investors nowadays or uh, our product uh, is such a way uh, um, uh, developed that uh, they are attracted towards that? I think if I can, if I get your question right, it's very difficult to, uh, from our perspective, see again, I think we, the way we see, we are a supermarket, I think we need to keep offering whatever different investors want. Uh, and uh, uh, at this point of time, as far as the ETFs are concerned, like if you were to look at the market, there will always be investors uh, uh, to the earlier question, which was there on B30 or smaller locations, you have investors coming in smaller locations who invest in the 500 rupees safe, they will always come in active. There are family offices uh, who take a directional view on the market. Uh, for them, ETFs becomes an important thing. So um, I think the point what I'm with your question is, it's, um, I think our view is not optimistic. The way we see is that I think we need to provide what is there where, for, uh, for whatever there is a need in the market. And uh, there has been, you know, I mean, investors, uh, have been certain investors, you know, and especially these uh, savvy investors have been moving towards ETF. And the, from our perspective, we are just trying to cater to their need. I think one of the, the two criteria is I think whenever anybody is investing in ETF, uh, which remains is basically A is going to be the tracking error. Uh, the other one is going to be the uh, liquidity. And, uh, be, and because with liquidity comes the impact cost. Uh, because I think the fact that if an investor is coming into ETF to uh, a low cost ETF, and if uh, there is no liquidity in the market and he ends up uh, um, uh, paying an impact cost of 2%, I mean the purpose is defeated. So liquidity plays an important role. So from our perspective, we remain nimble. I think we continue evaluating the opportunities. Uh, at this point of time also, in this quarter we launched one ETF. We have, uh, 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 we have already got SEBI approval for certain more ETFs. 
and I think we'll continue uh, completing our suit. Okay, so my my second question is nowadays we read much about uh, the funds of the individual investors going towards uh, individual selection of uh, equity as far as equity investment is concerned, and uh, they are uh, redeeming from the mutual funds are not uh, uh, favoring the investment in AMC mutual funds. Is that correct? And if yes, then what is the trade? How we we would like to fight for you and develop the cult of mutual fund again in Indian investors? I think. Huh? So, so this is uh, you know we have always seen that when these markets are volatile, you know you see the cyclical nature, and uh, you know investors do turn to towards equity. Uh, but if you see uh, you know in the past also you know mutual you know uh, once this uh, you know volatility will die down and obviously people will return and you know go back to their offices, uh, you know. Uh, the bulk of their money again they will uh, invest back to the professional investor uh, professional investment manager to manage so i think uh, the good part is because of uh, direct investing you know if new uh, dmat account has been opened you know at least we are happy that more and more people have been exposed to the capital market and some point of time you know they will also start allocating to uh, you know towards mutual fund because my bond was in, uh, more near to the spiva report latest that uh, major of the fund could not even uh, outperform the benchmark index my worry was that is why the investors are shying away from what is the trend that was that was i wanted to understand i think your point i think the way we see is in you know, a different market cycles i think we will have there will be times when active funds will do well there will certain segments passive will do well i think and from our point of view like we said i think we see it as two different business lines within the amc and uh, for us i think uh, we let investor make the choice fine so my last question is regarding our current strength how we are encashing on it uh, what are the strategies to uh, lure the world over the huge fund lying across the border and uh, what are the strategies of our, our fund to bring that fund to india Yeah. on the lighter side you know right now all borders are closed because of covid nothing can come inside <laughs> india and no thing can go outside india so right now for the next couple of quarters we want to continue focusing on building up what is there but i think clearly as mentioned in past uh, nippon uh, life remains committed uh, in helping the business and leveraging all the businesses on nippon life uh, uh, in uh, getting both the flows into india and more than only the flows also some of the best practices and integrating the different businesses so again i mean uh, there is uh, not much to talk about that in this quarter but i am sure uh, this remains an important focus area for us but i think in subsequent quarters we will keep updating you on this that's great good luck to you sir thanks for answering my question thank you ladies and gentlemen due to time constraint we will take that as a last question on behalf of bnk securities india private limited that concludes this conference thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines thank you thank you very much